is Christian Adame. I'm the manager of Lifelong Learning here at the Crocker Art Museum. I work in the education department, and I was involved in putting this program together. Um, so again, we're just so excited you all are all here tonight to witness this. This is our first in our Icons and Conversation series um, with our chief curator, Scott Shields, and um, Wayne Thiebaud, which is probably the reason everyone's here tonight. <laughs> 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 uh, we, of course, encourage all of you to visit the exhibition Wayne Tebow Homecoming, which is located on our second floor, um, and it's going to be on view uh, through November 28th. We'd also like to extend our thanks to our sponsor of the exhibition, Sacktown Magazine, so let us please give them a round of applause for their time. Uh, all right, so now without further ado, let's get this started. And I want to uh, just join me in welcome, welcoming our Chief Curator, Scott Shields. Well, I also just want to thank you all for coming and just say what a pleasure this is for me. I went to school, many of you know, at the University of Kansas, and they had a really wonderful Tebow painting there called Around the Cake. And um, as it turns out, it came from a collector in Sacramento. And so I grew up or went to school with that painting. And I remember the docents used to put the kids in a circle around the, the main cake was in the center and the little pieces of cake were around it. And they used to act this out, which was probably the stupidest docent activity I ever saw. But um, <laughs> it, it, it was my favorite painting in, in, the, in the Spencer Museum of Art. So to be able to one day end up at the Crocker and to do an interview with Wayne is just a privilege for me that you can't even believe. Um, and I'm not, I told Wayne I'm not going to do a lot of going on about his laurels because you all know them or you wouldn't be here. Uh, certainly Sacramento's most famous artist, internationally recognized, um, and we're never going to have another one like him. And so I think that it's a great privilege and an honor to have him here, and I would just like to welcome Wayne Tebow. like to say before we get started? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so, for coming. So what, what I have is a group of just sort of questions generally. And um, we're going to turn this off for a minute. And then after I get through my general questions, then I have some questions that are related to specific images, either images in the show or images in our permanent collection. And, Frankly, a lot of the questions are things that my own inquiring mind has wanted to know for a while, and some are fun and some are more serious, and we'll just see how it goes. We did no rehearsing, so Wayne has not heard any one of these questions. Um, so, so here we go. Um, I've often wondered whether you prefer pie or cake. <laughs> Lemon meringue pie. Lemon meringue pie. Um, I s sort of structured the questions early to, to more recent in a way. And one of the things that I, I've often wondered is your time in Utah as a youth. Do you feel like that influenced your work in any way? I'm sure. I think it certainly gave me a great love of landscape. Southern Utah is a phenomenal landscape place, and so highly varied. In St. George, uh, you have a lot of real beautiful red earth country. And Cedar City, not far away from that, maybe 50 miles as I remember, there's a great number of mountainscapes that I remember. So much so that I started painting mountains again about a little while ago, and one was called Timber Top, uh, a mountain where we had a ranch. And I always thought of it as a, a huge, high, monolithic structure that one day I was determined I was going to climb. 
Later on, when friends went to see it and I told them about it, I said, you mean that little molehill just out <laughs> there? <of Boston City?" laughs> so something about the capacity of landscapes there uh, gave some sort of special monumentalizing idea to it or something, but that certainly did have a lot to do with that and the farming and ranching and so on. It's always been, I thought actually that's the way I'd end up. Is a farmer a rancher? Yeah. Me too. That's my fallback plan. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think your career would be different if you had never had the 1962 Allen Stone Gallery exhibition in New York? Well, I'd had a perfectly wonderful life of just teaching school and showing in galleries here. Fortunately, that was always a great thing to me, to have people for such a long time uh, would buy some things and uh, that for me is probably the most real experience. When things happen that you don't expect, when things become more than you think they can be, certainly when you think, I know my paintings are not worth that much money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, certainly different and I would have, I think, been quite content and happy to live without that uh, other thing, whatever it is. I like it here. <laughs> so. Do you, how do you think your paintings would physically look different, if at all, other than the obvious, you know, this is a different cityscape, landscape? Hard to say, but I think uh, the other thing which I should bring up, I think, is the fact that I'm really as much a teacher as anything. And that life has been a great joy and pleasure for me. So since my particular kind of painting just depends mostly on what we do when we teach people or try to teach them how to paint. You set a problem and uh, go after that problem. And I don't think it's ever been, or I hope it would not have ever been different from that. You hope that the problem that you can set can uh, captivate you, challenge you, make you want to uh, contend with that great tradition of painting. You have to remember that one thing about being a painter is that you're, you're part of this wonderful tra tradition that starts some 30,000 years ago with cave painters and then comes up through the long evol evolutionary history of those marvelous great tradition of painters. So then you try to learn to do something like drawing and think, well, how do I be a painter? And I'll try to get some help and so on. And the problem suddenly suggests to you what in the world am I thinking of picking up a brush when there's a painter like Rembrandt out there? <laughs> I mean, think of how crazy you have to be, you know, <laughs> and how almost silly it is. <clears throat> You're going to try to be a painter? I'd like to try. Well, you may as well give up now. <laughs> it's impossible to be a fan. I mean, just let me read 50 names to you, and you can imagine what those 50 names are, your own se selection of them. 
from Vermeer to Velasquez to Degas to Picasso to Rembrandt, on and on and on, the Chinese painting, Japanese woodblocks, Mayan ceramics. I mean, why do it? <laughs> because it's such fun. <laughs> Even if you fail, it doesn't matter. You, know, you get this little <laughs> thing you're looking at. You know. huh, that's, that's not too bad. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. I don't think it changes much uh, if you're, if you love painting. I mean, we have to recognize how many marvelous and serious painters there all are out there who we don't even know about here in Sacramento and all across all worlds. There are people who love to draw and paint, and they hope for the best, but they're prepared for the worst. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to pay attention to me. You know. Nobody's. So you make your peace with that. And you say, the attention has to be on trying to not ignoble the tradition of something that you're so privileged to be a part of. <laughs>